attempt to produce an audio video record of this book, which is no longer in publication, Our Yesteryears by Paul Jones. Our Yesteryears, a narrative history of White Creek, New York, by Paul Jones, illustrated. Forward, that the history of the town of White Creek would one day be set down in permanent form has been the cherished wish of many of our townspeople. During preparations for the 1959 Year of History observance, the idea crystallized and took shape, and the writer was approached by a committee from the Adult Fellowship Group of the Germain Methodist Church with the proposal that if he would compile and write such a history, they would publish it. To local people, and those intimately connected with White Creek, this narrative will be read both subjectively and objectively. First, for its word picture of a place and a people they hold dear. Second, for its appraisal of their community and its role in the nation's destiny. To outsiders, it prevents and presents an objective study of a small community and a larger scheme of things, and shows that no place, however quiet and unpretentious it may appear on the surface to be, is ever without its dramatic side when being viewed critically. This first picture is a sketch by Jeffrey Jones of the way he thought the trading post would have looked in 1711. The following one is another picture from the book which I did a primitive colorization job on to show what the trading post looked about the time when I was a boy. I did have a chance to go through it with my parents when it was still in good shape. The next picture is one I took in 2003 about 18 years ago when I walked through that area and took a few snapshots of the place, and the last one is of the inside at the same time. It's very doubtful if anything remains today. I haven't been up there lately. This book is divided into chapters, but the chapters jump around because of the way it was printed, so what I'm going to do is read through one chapter at a time then throw in a few comments at the end. The first chapter that starts on page 3 is chapter 1, The Indians of White Creek. The history of the Indian people, our antecedents here and the original occupants of the land where we have our homes today, makes for enchanting reading and fascinating study. <clears throat> and for some of us at least, they were not antecedents merely, but ancestors as well. Will Rogers was proud of his Cherokee blood, and the author and historian of the Hoosick Valley, Grace Greylock Niles boasted her Abenaki inheritance. The growing popularity of both old and new books on Indian lore goes to show that these picturesque people have at last won the respect and even the affection of mankind. White Creek is not without its romantic associations of the Indian period. Our native Indians were the Hoosacks, sometimes called the Horicons, a subtribe of the Mohicans, immortalized in the writings of James Fenimore Cooper. The Hoosacks and Horicons are known by various other names, the Sequins, Hoosacks, Sequansacks, and Hoosequans. The name Horicon is doubtless a corruption of the latter. Dr. Cadwell Adder Cole, the colonial governor of New York and an Indian authority, refers to, them, refers to the Mohicans as the River Indians, whom he says the French called the Morrigans, the Hoosacks or Horicons they called the Horigans. It would be presumptuous to say that the Hoosac Indians were the first human inhabitants of White Creek or the Hoosac Valley. Other and unrelated tribes and nations doubtless preceded them here. In prehistoric times, and in the still more dim and distant past, the Eskimo dwelt in this vicinity, as recent archaeological discoveries have revealed. The record of the Hoosacs and Mohicans does, however, provide a starting point for our history they being the first human beings of which we have any substantial body of information and fact of which to write. That the Indian comes from one of the older races of mankind is not disputed, but his origin remains shrouded in mystery. Theories along this line have one after another been discarded, including the notion that he descended from the so-called lost, lost tribes of Israel. The Indians are Ganoanians, or bow and arrow men. As some men gravitated to agriculture, others to maritime pursuits and trade and the building of towns and cities, the red man found only the life of the huntsman rewarding. Without the chase, he withered and died, his hunting ground with his deep forests and familiar, so familiar to his fleet feet. The rippling streams and placid pools made for his chief's delight and gave him his concept of a life everlasting. 
From exile to my kingdom I return to winds and waters, counselors of mine. My palace yonder lake where sunsets burn, my palace roof, the blue against yon pine, anonymous. The Mohican Sacks and Hussacks, tribe and sub-tribe, are one of the most conspicuous groups of the great Algonquin family, which occupied the most of Canada and nearly all that portion of the present United States east of the Mississippi and north of the 37th parallel of latitude. A principal village of the Mohicans was in Rensselaer County, opposite the present city of Albany, and the chief village of the Hussacks was within the present town of White Creek, along the Hoosick River, on the meadowland above the Owl Hill. Here was located the castle of the chief, Soquan, the wise, the owl and orator of his tribe. In the center of that great expanse of territory occupied by the Algonquins and cut off from contact with other nations were the fierce Iroquois. The French called them the Five Nations, and they held the territory now the state of New York, along the Finger Lakes, between these lakes and Lake Ontario, and east to within a few miles of the Hudson. <coughs> The English called them the Confederates, the Dutch the Maquas, and they called themselves the Agencioni, which meant United People. The Five Nations were composed of the Mohawks in the east, next west the Oneidas, then the Anadagas, the Cayugas, and the Senecas. The Mohawks and Mohican Hoosics were hereditary enemies. When Ato Tarho XII was king of the Five Nations, about 50 years before Columbus's voyage to America, the Mohawks were at war with the Mohican Hoosics. The Indians are said to have had a passion for war and took to their war paths with a sense of satisfaction, excelled only by their love of the hunting ground. Their wars were not for conquest so much as for vengeance. To forgive an injury was counted womanly and weak, to seek revenge a manly and noble virtue. Their military strategy turned on the elements of surprise and swift attack. Warfare in this manner between the Mohawks and Mohican Hoosics was carried on continually. It was maintained by small expeditions of first one foe and then the other, enjoying the sudden covert attack to inflict swift energy and injury on the enemy, and then as suddenly to retreat. The attacks were made at such irregular intervals that their freedom from hostilities was often of lengthy duration. The Indian race was identified by certain strong traits of character. These were a sense of personal independence, willfulness of action, freedom from restraint. The idea of a civil authority over his own personal passions, will, and purposes was intolerable. The chief's authority extended no further than to be first in battle, foremost in danger, and most cunning. In the high council, only matters of expediency were resolved and the high Sachem never undertook to impose his will on a dissenting minority. In peacetime, the Indian's nature shone to better advantage, but even in his best estate he was an unsocial, solitary spirit. He sat apart, a man of the woods, communing with himself in the genius of solitude. The forest was better than his wigwam. It was a way of life that tended to degrade womankind, and often imposed on them a life of drudgery, to offset the reckless freedom of the men. The Hussacks' abode was a wigwam, a dozen or more poles set up in a circle, brought together and secured at the top, and covered with the skins of animals. Coarsely woven mats covered the floor, sometimes a rude hut substituted for the wigwam, and these were made of hickory saplings formed into arches and secured with wise, then covered with large squares of bark. Their utensils were surprisingly well made, considering their want of appropriate tools. Arrow making has become a lost art. The earthen pots carrying the impress of the mats used to shape them were a pleasing design. The warrior's trusty bow and arrow was formidable indeed, but his tomahawk was indispensable. Clothing was designed to cover the body only below the waist and was so styled for men and women. The women's skirts and men's leggings were of deerskin or elk side, and their moccasins were fashioned of the same material. The men painted their bodies in a grotesque and fantastic manner, especially when on the warpath, and hung about them trophies such as scalps of enemies, fangs of rattlesnakes, etc. Their writing was meager, stickmen and rude drawings symbolic of ideas they sought to convey, were cut in rock and etched upon tree trunks. Their language was sparing but of great force, and they expressed themselves in a roundabout fashion, as for example to deceive was to talk with a split tongue. In his personal appearance, the Hussack was taller than Europeans, but lighter in build. 
Her eyes were very dark but not prominent. The face was well proportioned with high cheekbones and a generous nose. Their religion was based on the belief in the great spirit, the Manitou, which ruled the elements, and was everywhere present, which favored the obedient and punished the wrongdoer. They believed in a host of lesser spirits, some good, some bad, some that brought peace, sunshine, and plenty, others that brought famine, pestilence, and grief. The medicine man or prophet, they thought, could establish contact with the spirit world by fasting and prayer, and could in this way inform them of an impending events. These rites and ceremonies were carried on with great solemnity and sincerity. The owl or orders sacrificial altar to the great Manitou, and Hobomak, the god of thunder, was located just below the junction of the Elkhill with the Hoosick River. The Hoosack Kitsman, the great powwow priest, used the quartz crystal rock found so abundantly in the Taconic Hills to carve symbols of the Wacken bird, spirit dove, to appease the thunder god. The Hoosacks and Mohicans called the translucent quartz the rocks of light, which the eye of the morning reflects from the hilltops, and to them they became the Manitou or Senia, or spirit stones. In every burial ground were included some personal effects of the deceased and ceremonial pieces to see the departed comfortably along his journey to the happy hunting ground. In the tombs of the Kitsmak, Powwow priest, and as an in indication of his holy office, have been found rock and bird stones, quartz crystals carved in the form of a dove, the Hussack symbol of peace. <coughs> Symbols of the Wackenbird were incorporated in each gate that formerly hung from the Arch of Truth, the entrance to the old Knickerbocker Mansion at Old Skatico. A symbol of the Wackenbird can be seen today where it is carved on the huge beam over the fireplace in the old Van Corlear and Lake Trading Post in White Creek, New York. A reproduction of the symbol is shown below. Sites of several planting grounds have been fixed in the White Creek area, including Chief Soquan's cornfield of a dozen acres at the junction of the Owlkill and the Hoosick, and lands belonging to the Moses family. On the edge of this field and up against the present Troy and Hoosick Road was the site of Chief Stroquan's castle, and it was here that the ceremonial fires were continuously burning. It is not uncommon today to dislodge quantities of charcoal and embers when working the land near this site. The pumpkin and bean fields in the village of Maohu, the Pequot, were situated along the Papanek Creek, a tributary of North White Creek. Ceremonial items, hammers and celts, tomahawks and arrowheads, and instruments of agriculture used by the Hoosick Indians have been found in the Hoosick Valley of White Creek. The Vandenberg, Harrington, and Moses families in particular have made excellent collections of these valuable relics. The Hoosack and Mohicans belong to the great Abenaki democracy of New York and New England, the most important kind of federation of the Algonquin people. The Abenaki capital was located at Cheskodanta, the Indian village opposite Albany. In 1609, they moved their capital to Skodak. I'll only make a couple of comments in this section. The Indian bow could fire faster than conventional firearms at the time, but it was short and the Indians used a pinch grip, so it was nowhere near as powerful as the English longbow or modern bows. The Eskimos never lived in this part of the continent. I have a vague recollection of somebody advancing that idea back then, but it is not correct. Recent and very interesting DNA studies have shown that Paleo-Eskimos crossed the Bering Strait about 7,000 years ago and spread out across the Arctic. They reached Greenland but had withdrawn long before the Vikings arrived around 985 and it entirely disappeared from the high Arctic sometime before 1150. When a second wave of Thule people, ancestors of today's Inuit, followed the path of the paleo climate change or European diseases could have caused all of this. About 1150, the Arctic began to cool rapidly, causing increased sea ice and harsher living conditions. But the Eskimos never got anywhere near this part of the country.